very good afternoon the department of uh, sanskrit studies is organizing this distinguished lecture on panini mission by professor gerard huet from india france to start with uh, i would like to invite our two doctor scholars to render the invocation mr uh, malai maithi and mr avilal gangopadhyay on the dais ओ गणनाथ सरस्वती रविशुक्र बृहस्पति पंचयता संस्मर निेदवाणी प्रवर्त हरि ओं जज्जाग्रत दूर मुदैति दैवंतुसुप्त तथ वैति दूरंगमंज्योति खाज्योतिरे कन्मे मन शिव संकल्पमस्तु जेन कर्माण्यपसो मनी क्षिणो जगे कृण्वंतिदे खुधीरा जद पूर्व जक्षम प्रजानन्मे मन शिव संकल्पमस्तु जत प्रज्ञानूत चेतो धृतिश्चाज ज्योतिरंतरमृत प्रजासु जस्मारेते किंचन कर्म क्रियते तन्मे मन शिव संकल्पमस्तु जेनेदम भूत भुवन भाविख्यत पारिग्रहीतमृते न सर्व जेन जगस्तायते सप्त होता तन्मे मन शिव संकल्पमस्तु जस्च साम जजो गुंखे यस्तिष्ठिता रथना भाविवारा जस्तुंगत प्रजानन्मे मन शिव संकल्पमस्तु सुखारथिश्वाणी वजन्मुखियानेयते भीषु गर्भाजिन इव हृत्प्रातिष्ठिरंजविष्ठन्मे मन शिव संकल्पमस्तु हरि ओं मे रिक्वेस्ट our dean uh, professor v krishna garu to extend a uh, formal formal welcome to all the guests and also now we have our uh, pro vice chancellor professor b rajshekar garu here i request him to uh, occupy the dais on the stage please and also meet I thought this will be done by our dean. To invite you all for this prestigious distinguished lecture by Professor Gerard Hood, Emeritus Professor of Inria Center, Paris. I welcome, on behalf of University of Hyderabad and School of Humanities, uh, Professor. Gerard Hood to occupy chair. Yes, sir. I don't know much about Professor Gerard, but uh, the paper uh, given to me. says that uh, is well known for his major and seminal contributions to type theory programming language theory and uh, theory of computation uh, i feel uh, honor to invite him uh, i hope you all enjoy his presentations thank you it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce professor hue to this august gathering professor hue is mathematician computer scientist and computational linguist he graduated from university of delhi didero then uh, he also had his phd from case western reserve university and then university de paris He has been a senior researcher, research director at Inria Paris from 
1989 to 2013 and has now emeritus status. He is a member of French Academy of Sciences and also a member of Academy Europe. He is known as uh, Professor uh, our Dean has uh, mentioned, he is known for his major and seminal contributions to type theory, programming language theory and the theory of computation. He contributed to the theory of unification and under his leadership, a new programming language CAMEL was developed. He also led the COC project and developed COC proof assistant. And Professor Hewer received the Herbrand Award in 1998 and uh, EACTS, the European Association for Theoretical Computer Science Award in 2009. He was awarded uh, two important uh, awards. He was uh, the ACM SIGPLAN Programming Language Software Award in 2013 for the development of CAMEL and very next year in 2014 uh, for his work on the COC proof assistant he was uh, given ACM Software Award. Some 20 years ago uh, he developed interest in Indian culture and wanted to read and understand some texts which led him to the field of computational linguistics. In 2007, he took lead and organized the first symposium on uh, Sanskrit computational linguistics at Paris in Rio. And since then, he is leading the community. He has been collaborating with our department uh, since its, its inception and has been an inspiration for all our students. His major contribution to the field of Sanskrit computational linguistics, uh, I will say, is the segmenter or Sandhi splitter as all of us uh, call it, that works in almost linear time, I will say. He has developed various tools for the phonetical, morphological and lexical analysis of Sanskrit and this led to the development of a Zen computational linguistics toolkit. His research in the field of Sanskrit computational linguistics has led to a new paradigm of relational programming inspired by Samuel Ellenberg's X machine. In today's talk, Professor Hewitt will talk about the impressions, as I understand, as a computer scientist about the Panini's grammar. Panini's grammar, as all of us know, is an almost complete grammar for Sanskrit written some 2500 years ago in a sutra style. So, uh, I thank Professor Hewitt for accepting our invitation to deliver this talk and welcome him. Thank you, Professor Amba. A respected Professor Gerard Q, the Dean School of Humanities, Professor V. Krishna, Professor Prasad, Professor Amba Kulkarni, and my senior colleagues, Professor Gedi Sen, Professor Aloka Sen, Professor Vama Shragaru, and my colleagues, my students. On behalf of University of Hyderabad, I welcome Professor Gerard Hugh for this distinguished lecture. He is going to speak on Panini's machine and we are celebrating this uh, distinguished lecture on an auspicious day where Sir C. V. Raman's birthday today. We are celebrating the C. V. Raman's birthday and we are hosting this uh, event in auditorium which is named after Dr. C. V. Raman. The another coincidence that tomorrow and day after tomorrow, the University of Hyderabad is hosting 85th annual meeting of uh, Indian Academy of Sciences Bangalore, which was founded by C.V. Raman. So I think we are, so today is his birthday and tomorrow day after we are going to host uh, the conference and workshop. Then today we are going to have this lecture. Thanks to Professor K.D. Sain for reminding us about this piece of information. So looking at the uh, profile of uh, Professor Gerard. I think we all of us know that he is a distinguished professor and invented a lot of things in any way, developed a lot of softwares and Professor Ramba said last decade has been helping our center and uh, all of us are eager to listen to Professor Gerard. I personally thank Professor Gerard on behalf of University of Hyderabad for accepting our invitation and for delivering this distinguished talk. Now I request uh, Professor Gerard Hugh to deliver the distinguished talk. Well, good afternoon. This is maybe a bit loud. Yes. 
I am not a Sanskritist, I'm a computer scientist. And when I started uh, getting interested into the computational treatment of Sanskrit, I uh, heard, of course, about Panini's grammar. But I had the idea that it was such an ancient grammar that it had mostly historical interest. Then I was very surprised to progressively learn that it was a very precise grammar of Sanskrit, actually. Precise to the point that it looks like a computer program. So this is very intriguing. Uh, but uh, of course, there are all kinds of uh, urban legends concerning Sanskrit and Panini. So I would like to start by debunking them and giving some context. Um, so here are some uh, Panini and myth and fake news. So uh, first, Panini's grammar is perfect, and I don't have any problem with that. It is written in Sanskrit. This I doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Natural language understanding is a big AI challenge. Yes, this is true. But then people draw some weird conclusion that Sanskrit is the ultimate programming language for AI applications. And this is uh, just, uh, 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 this is just uh, nonsense. And uh, uh, then there are some uh, uh, conspiracy statements added to it, like uh, NASA is working secretly on this paradigm. So this has been going on for some time, you know, the uh, Sanskrit teaching is mandatory at NASA and, uh, and so you have to know, know well Sanskrit in order to be admitted to NASA and NASA is preparing this supercomputer based on Panini. Uh, and all this was explained in Ford magazine in 1987. And uh, this is just fake news. You can uh, look in your library at the whole collection of Ford magazine and you will not find anything about uh, Sanskrit and, uh, and Panini and uh, using it uh, for programming AI. So, what is the, the origin of the myth? The origin is an article by somebody called Rick Briggs in an AI magazine in 1985. So this is true, uh, you read it in its time and uh, it's, uh, it's a paper that uh, suggests the use of uh, Nyaya and uh, especially uh, Navya Nyaya formalism for knowledge representation, which is one of the big challenges of artificial intelligence. And uh, the article is an interesting reading. Uh, I would say it is uh, just strictly correct, if I may use this uh, neologism. It's innovative. It's relevant, uh, but it has not been substantiated so far by concrete development. And Rick Briggs vanished. You cannot find him on Facebook or any other, uh, you know, telephone directory, nothing. He, he just vanished in thin air. So maybe Rick Briggs never existed. Maybe it was a pseudonym, no information. But you have, uh, his article has been duplicated on the web in various forms, you know, people have retyped it, they have added uh, photos of rockets lifted and so on. <laughs> and, uh, and it was impossible to have the rumor. Yes. If the NASA director would, uh, you know, go to the press conference and say, we are not working on Sanskrit, this would be proof that he's hiding it. So, so, uh, I think Panini deserves better credit than all these rumors. So, let me give a little uh, bit of uh, some opinions about what is Sanskrit. I would say Sanskrit is not a natural language. It is uh, somehow an artificial intelligence, uh, an artificial language that was crafted. It was crafted from the current 
uh, natural languages at the time, which are the, the Prakrit. Prakrit means natural. So, so it's inspired from these natural languages. Uh, so people uh, speaking the related Prakrit could understand Sanskrit. Uh, but it's a high, uh, high register learned language, which is neither used as vernacular language, so you cannot uh, tell your rickshaw, you know, bring me to University of Hyderabad in Sanskrit. This is, uh, d this is, uh, does not work. And it, uh, it is not, it has never been the mother tongue of anybody. Eh? Question data. <laughs> it has been rarely the mother tongue of anyone, I would say. Uh, so it's a high register learned language. And by learned, I mean learned in, in two senses. Yes, it's learned in the sense that you have to learn it at school. So, uh, uh, Brahmin boys typically at the age of eight would go to Gurukula and then uh, start learning Sanskrit for 12 years. Yes? And it's learned in the sense that it was meant as a precise medium for rational argumentation. So Shastric uh, argumentation and so on. And then it, it was used by literature and poets, etc. Okay, so it's a, it's a, a, a learned language in these two senses. And uh, I would say uh, classical Sanskrit actually is co extensive with Panini's grammar. See, uh, there, is, there are these discussions between linguists. Oh, is this a descriptive language? Or is it a prescriptive language, a prescriptive grammar? And uh, it's, <laughs> it's so well descriptive that actually you can look at it as the definition of Sanskrit. Yes, and then it doesn't make any sense to ask whether it's descriptive. And it became de facto prescriptive. Which does not mean that Sanskrit did not continue to evolve. So with time, Sanskrit evolved. You have various styles, and but uh, this evolution took place within the limitations of the grammar. So for instance, at Panini's time, compounding was rather limited. You had com compounds with two segments, sometimes three segments, but there were not these long compounds that the poets took advantage of. Nevertheless, Panini, by reason of economy, he wanted to have a very short description. He gave a recursive definition of compounding, which allows the, uh, the use of the grammar to form arbitrary long compounds. We can have a compound that runs for uh, one or two pages. So, actually, in some sense, not only Panini's grammar is a very good descriptive grammar, but its descriptive precision increased with the years, because people were using all kinds of constructions that were not present in the uh, in the original spoken language, so it's kind of paradoxical. So Sanskrit is very peculiar among the human languages. Now Panini's grammar is not written in Sanskrit, and I hope I will convince you of that by looking at some of the rules. And it is definitely not a computer program per se. So it's related to programming, but in other ways. It's a formal document prescribing mechanical operations. And I think it's kind of similar to the operations manual of an abstract machine. 
even even a, a real computer, see, a chip has specifications in uh, that are explained in the uh, in its operation manual that tell you that if you execute this precise uh, instruction, then the machine will change state in this very precise way. Okay, so so it, this is of this nature that you have to understand Panini's grammar. So it's very different from usual grammar that say uh, you can do that, but you should not uh, say that, and blah blah. Okay, so it's a, it's a very precise definition of the language, uh, which can be somehow uh, assimilated to an abstract machine. So what kind of computer are you talking about? When I, you know, when I speak of Panini machine, people have open big eyes. Uh, computers are no more crunching machines. Grammar concerns speech production, syntax, meaning, etc. How could a study IE be compared to a computer? Well, computers are universal computer computing machines. They can operate on any symbolic material that may represent any natural phenomenon. But machines, in general, they are more specialized automata. Uh, Jacquard machines, they automate textile design production. Uh, automatic pianos, they automate music production, even if you don't like their music. <laughs> Here, Panini machines automate Sanskrit speech production. So it's a specialized machine. Actual concrete Panini machines. When I uh, submitted the abstract of my talk, a Michael Kearney, madame, said, what, what machine are you talking about? Show me a concrete Panini machine. And my answer to this objection is easy. Eh? Any competent pandit is a biological Panini machine. By learning by all the grammar, they are able to physically realize the Paninian operations, at least in the following sense. They teach their students how to operate the grammar, and they demand of their students to be able to give the precise sequence of sutras justifying their li linguistic production. Furthermore, if the student produces a sequence, it's called prakriya, that either invokes illegally a sutra, illegal instruction in the machine, or results in a non-intended meaning of the enunciation, a pundit is able to point out the precise point where the student has erred. So in this sense, they are living Panini machines. Okay, now I don't put words in my mouth, yes? I am not suggesting that pandits have developed some uh, specific neuronal structure in their brain that emulates a panini machine. But just that they have internalized the grammar enough to explain proper linguistic production according to the rules of the machine. More objections. A more subtle objection is that pandits may be using all kinds of additional knowledge about the language and somehow use hidden meta-rules, these famous Paribasha rules, which uh, are uh, argued a lot about. What are the Paribasha rules? Are there, are there more Paribasha rules? There are all kinds of debates. So some are not explicitly stated in HDI. So this suggests that a software implementation executing actual electronic hardware which emulate the machine should definitely settle the matter. Does it make sense to talk about the Panini machine or not? Th th this is the point. We shall come back to electronic Panini and machines later. For the, machi for the moment we shall use the automatic piano analogy. Okay, so, so we imagine the pandit as some kind of organ player. Uh, organ is like piano, but it has you know, lots of keyboards. 
Okay, it's a complicated machine. So here you have uh, you have four thousand uh, a keyboard with four thousand keys for every sutra, and uh, and here you have uh, a keyboard with uh, five hundred uh, uh, keys for the Runadi sutras, and uh, and then you have the the Datupata with uh, I don't know fifteen hundred uh, uh, buttons to take the roots out. And so on and so forth. There are many, many databases you need in order to operate the machine. So, so we assume they are there, and the pandit knows how to operate them sequentially. <coughs> the, the, the organ is not speaking Sanskrit in real time. Yeah, you operate the machine, and it's only at the end that you get the enunciation. Uh, uh, so the so at the end of the sentence we have a speech production, okay. So you can pipe the machine into a, a speed uh, speed generation and have a Sanskrit spoken. Then we, when we understand that, then we'll replace the pundit with a tape input, <laughs> you know, like the automatic piano. It it, it works on a, on a tape. Okay, so uh, here we have to keep in mind uh, this uh, <laughs> 18th century, the Mechanical Turk. Uh, some of you may know uh, all about Mechanical Turk because of Google. It is uh, using this analogy. Uh, this was an automaton that was constructed to play chess automatically. Okay, it claimed to play chess automatically. Okay, but it was a hoax. It was fake. Yeah, th there was a, a dwarf, a little man, who knew very well chess, who was hidden inside the machine, and he would direct the moves of the Turk automaton. Yeah, this is the machine. Yeah, so I'm debunking the Turk automaton fraud. So these are people would uh, gaze at uh, this uh, fake Turk playing excellent chess, but the real player was hidden inside the machine. Okay, so 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 we don't want uh, we don't want to pend it hidden in our machine. Yes, we have to take him out completely. Uh, now let's make a little overview of uh, Panini's grammar. Oh, uh, you have so many qualifiers of grammar. Is it a generative grammar? Is it a dependency grammar? Uh, what is sure is that it's not a phrase structure grammar because you don't have phrase structure in uh, in Sanskrit. Uh, in a nutshell, it is both. It has generative morphology, and phrase structure is analyzed according to dependency. Okay, so you have these two levels of words and sentence. And, uh, and then you have this generative view of morphology and this analytic view of uh, dependency graph of your sentence. So sentential consistency deals with dependency constraint analysis. Okay, so the correspondence is that the notion of karaka is similar to semantic role. And the notion of Arkansha, Arkansha is desire, desire like uh, this primit this transitive verb, uh, the desire of an object to apply to. Okay, so the, the, the grammar at sentence level is organized in terms of fulfilling these desires, and fulfilling the desires is akin to building the dependency structure. So semantics here, it's, uh, it's similar to Barrois situation theory. See, we describe an abstract uh, situation and there are actors that play certain role. Okay, and, and, uh, and you make sense in terms of these roles. So, uh, so you should not put too, too much uh, logic in that and you should not uh, try to relate it too directly to modeling reality. 
Okay, so there, uh, there is some uh, uh, confusion here. He, language is symbolic. It's more a theater than describing reality. Okay. Think of uh, Kadambari, for instance. In Kadambari, uh, there is a plot, however complicated it is. And you have uh, actors, you have roles, you have heroes, heroines, even if they uh, have several lives. So, at the end of the book, finally, you understand the plot, and everything is clear. Yes? But this has a, a little relation with reality. Yes? In reality, we don't have that many mad elephants and talkative parrots. Yes? So it's more like theater. Okay, um, I'm going to give an example of using Panini's grammar, but the kind of uh, overall view of the grammar is that you have this generative way of forming padas, words. So you have pada production, so you, you build one pada recursively, then you build the next pada, then you go pade pade, yes, and you form your whole sentence, yes. And now you assign characters semantic roles to these different padas. Yes, you watch that everybody is happy, all the concerns, all the wishes are satisfied. Then you take what has been produced, which is the pada pata, no? your path with the words, and then you hire on it with the last section of Ashtadhyayi, the tripadi section, which is some linear so you iron the phonetics, so it becomes smooth, yes? And then you speak. So that's, that's the overall uh, description of how to use the grammar. Now people are argue, what do you mean by generative? Uh, you know, uh, generative in what sense? Now you have two schools, at least. One is the uh, Artapakshi. You generate the form from the meaning. Okay, so many people are, uh, are of the strong opinion that you take the meaning of a sentence and then you produce the form using the grammar. Some people are uh, of the reverse opinion. They are the Shabda Pakshi. You generate the meaning from the form. So by the form of the sentence and using the grammar, then you find its meaning. At the beginning of my interest, I would uh, go to these conferences and I would see these uh, you know, senior professors at each other's throat, uh, red in the face, shouting ad hominem attacks, because each was defending his school. And of course, nobody won, yes, because both are wrong. So, but they are half, half true. Each is half true. The problem is that you cannot generate one from the other. They are mutually intricated. Okay? And this we, we know very well from computer science. You know, you have mutual recursion. One procedure A calls B and B calls C, so they work in coroutine fashion. Okay? But similarly, in mathematics, you prove by induction two lemmas together, and it's important. Okay? So similarly here. You have mutual dependency, so what you're generating is both. You generate a pair, the form, shabda, uh, phonetic production, and the meaning, arta. You generate both together, recursively. So this pair of the signifiant and the signifié is what De Saussure, who is considered as uh, the uh, first modern linguist in the Western sense in the 18th century, in the 19th century, uh, he, 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 he proposed this notion of sign, which combines the form and the meaning. So he said language 
is manipulating science at every level, at the world level, at the sentence level, and so on. And even said uh, the the field should not be uh, called linguistics; it should be called semiotics. So uh, uh, I am not. Uh, I'm not suggesting that actually Panini invented the notion of sign, but I'm suggesting that the notion of sign is implicit from Panini's work. Okay? And this was picked up by De Saussure because De Saussure was very familiar with Sanskrit. He made his thesis on the phonolo phonological system of Sanskrit. Uh, he was familiar with, uh, with Panini. So, uh, so many of his ideas actually percolated from the traditional grammar. Okay, so, so in some sense this is not a surprise that we, that we find uh, the notion of sign kind of implicit in Panini. Now the Saussure also uh, formulated a postulate about sign, which is the l'arbitraire du signe. The arbitrariness of sign. Okay? So where does that correspond to in Sanskrit? The, the arbitrariness of sign means that this link between the form and the meaning is arbitrary in the sense that it's different from one language to another. Okay? Uh, in the case of Panini, it was not a question of many languages, it was just Sanskrit. But I would propose that the notion of uh, arbitrariness of sign is that this relation is nitya. Now I am not going to elaborate on that because we have little time. But having this view of generating both the form and the meaning together raises the obvious question, what are you starting from? No, what is the input? Uh, so opening is grammar, it gives rules on, uh, you know, you have these two sides of language. You have, uh, you have uh, the speaker, yes, and the, you have the listener. So these are uh, completely <laughs> different processes. What Panini talks about is Shabda uh, Shristi, creation of language, rather than explaining Shabda Buddha, which is understanding the language, which is some kind of reverse process. So the input of the grammar is the locutor's communicative intention, the vivaksha. You want, because language is for communicating. Yeah, this, is the, this is the great advantage of our species over animals. We have articulated speech and we could use speech to communicate. Okay, so we, we do not limit our knowledge to our personal view. We communicate and then knowledge increases. Okay, but now uh, this vivaksha, eh, what is it? The locutor intends to communicate some meaning. You know, like the teacher is teaching, he wants to communicate knowledge to his students. But the form also matters. The form matters. The the one said the. Uh, 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 the medium is the uh, is message. <laughs> okay, so, so you have the medium, the, the, the message, and the way you phrase it, and both are important. So in your locutor's intention, you have both. So, so the meaning is ju not just uh, denotation, Abhidha. Eh? You have also connotation, Vyanjana. Okay, so uh, if you look at poetry, uh, what matters a lot is not so much Abhida, it's Vyanjana. And, uh, uh, and uh, it's even been uh, uh, axiomatized by uh, Ananta Vardana, you know, that the essence of poetry is to have actually more importance put on Vyanjana than Abhida. And he called this notion of Dwani. 
So for instance, I was uh, there is this uh, tradition of Sanskrit dictionaries over the years. There are many, there are hundreds of Sanskrit dictionaries. And many of them are dictionaries of synonyms and others are dictionaries of homonyms. And both are very important. See, when the poet wants to say something, so he, he wants to evoke some notion. Okay, now there are many synonyms to choose from, yes. And many one of the synonyms will, will be good for the meter, for instance. It will fit the meter, okay, so you take this one. But maybe also this synonym, it has homonyms, okay. And one homonym will uh, ring a bell somewhere and uh, give a coloration to what you say, make uh, the uh, connotation. Okay, so how do this uh, sign, uh, a constructive sign elaboration goes, goes along? So we uh, elaborate this uh, sentence sign recursively from word signs, from root signs. To the primitive signs, they are the verbal roots given with their atomic meaning. And both components are extracted from the root tables. The data pattern. Now morphology elaborates words from their component bases, prakriti, and suffixes, pratyaya. So for instance, for uh, nominals, from roots, we get credenta stems, stems are pradipadikas, from the data roots, and from crit suffixes. Then we can uh, use further uh, suffixes that are called tadita in order to get tadita antas. Then we can get inflection to get nominal forms, subantas using the subfile suffixes. So, so it all goes by this mechanism that you have uh, uh, a certain uh, prakriti, that is a certain natural form of the word. And then you have the pratyaya that acts as some kind of grinder of the form and also contains part that, uh, that constructs its meaning. On the verbal side, it's the same. We have uh, verbal form, the tinantas, that are from, from roots, lakaras, and tin suffixes. In all cases, these pratyaya yeah, yeah, suffixes bear the information to compute mechanically both the resulting compound form, the shabda, and its meaning, arta, expressed as a canonical prose paraphrase. But the way arta is coming is by paraphrase. Every construction has a standard paraphrase, and you compose this paraphrase, and then you get a meaning of the whole thing. Vigraha. All these elaboration procedures are really exact computing processes. Okay, so this is why I'm suggesting to consider Ashtadhyayi not just as a grammar, but actually as the operating manual of some abstract computer that I named this Panini machine. So let's look at one precise example to see exactly what I mean. Uh, but uh, on the way, we have to understand the basic data and control structures that are designed by Panini. Okay, so, so we must understand better both the data components and the meta-descriptive formalism of the machine. So these are the basics of Paninian calculus. The object language of the machine is Sanskrit represented at the phonemic level phonemic level, which is a discretization of articulated speech. This level is of a finer granularity than the syllabic level, explicit, for instance, in writing in syllabic alphabets, such as Devnagari. Okay? So if you do Sanskrit computational processing, you know, don't just think of doing everything on the UTF-8 representation of Devnagari. This will not work. Yes, you have to go down at the level of Varna. And Varna roughly corresponds to the modern notion of phoneme, 
Of course, certain professors will say this is not true, but this is roughly. These are, you know, phonetic segments. Okay, but from uh, now I will call them phony. The Varnamala is the Sanskrit alphabet as a list of 50 Varnas, carefully arranged in an algebraic manner. First you have vowels, then consonants. Each consonant represented in five layers. Five layers corresponding to the five articulation points in your mouth. Each layer giving the cross product of two phonetic Boolean features. Third versus voiced, unaspirated versus aspirated, and then the nasal. This is so beautiful. Look. Look, what a beauty. This is the Sanskrit alphabet. Yeah. All the vowels ranked, you know, short, long, short, long. And all the consonants in this nice square, the five articulation points you know, from down in the throat to in front with the lips. Yes, here are the thirds. Yes, the aspirated thirds. Here is the sonance, aspirated, the nasal. Yes, the uh, semi vowels and the sibilants. Well, so this is putting to shame the English alphabet. What, 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 what is the alphabet? What is this alphabet? Uh, I mean, this comes from Greek, yes, and it, it was never reformed. So at school today, in the 21st century, they are teaching at school, like at French school, the, the voice of French are A, E, I, O, U. That's what we are told. So there is no A. One of the most common voice is A. Or U? No, no, it doesn't count. For some. And then you have this jumping, you know, kind of then uh, all kinds of absurd things like E dans l'eau, for the writing uh, F, E dans l'eau, what is it? Uh, o with an E. So is it a ligature? No, it's not a ligature because you have coefficient, so it's not thing. It's absurd. But you will be teach it. And, uh, and teaching grammar is facilitating orthography. So we have this absurd orthography that uh, vaguely uh, was relevant in the 13th century for the uh, French of the, of the time and that had never evolved because it's sacred. The eh? French alphabet is sacred. So, so the poor uh, students they have to uh, learn by rote orthography and uh, this is presented as a scientific whereas it's totally absurd. And of course the poor foreigners don't know uh, what to make of that. <coughs> so this well-known algebraic structure of the discretized speech domain actually probably predates Panini. So, uh, so maybe uh, uh, many of these ideas actually should not be credited to Panini, but to former uh, uh, grammarians. So there were uh, lines of grammarians uh, before Panini, of which we know nothing, except when Panini refers to the mini sutras. So, uh, previous grammarians, for instance, have studied phonetics, chandras, in the framework of the Pratishakya treatises, you know, for understanding Vedas. But a brilliant innovation of the grammar is to duplicate the standard alphabet to serve as a set of metalinguistic markers usable to denote the microcode operations of a machine and various metalinguistic parameters so that the it markers in root description for people who know that upata. So these are called anubandas. And usually uh, people treat anubanda with some kind of scorn, you know, this is a technical detail. Yes, uh, no, don't worry about it. Yes. But no, no, it's a, it's a great innovation eh, to, have, uh, to, to be able to use the usual alphabet as uh, names of meta operations. Okay? If you think in terms of uh, writing, you know, we could write formula with all kinds of signs. But since this was oral tradition, you had to use the phonemes of the language in order to refer to these operations. Okay? 
And then Panini Sutra, they interleave the Varnas with the Anubandas in a complex manner. And understanding Panini Sutra demands that you know exactly how to distinguish the Varnas from the Anubandas. Okay, so, so people who are familiar with the grammar, they don't think about it, they know. Okay, but if we were to send to space Ashtadhyayi to some uh, other civilization, you know, they would receive Ashtadhyayi, they would not understand the thing. They would not understand that it's a grammar. It could be uh, you know, a submarine <laughs> blueprint for what they know, yes. And well, this is actually similar to uh, you know, take the operating system of any computer. Now you make an octal dump, you have zeros and ones. How can you make sense out of it? If you don't have the operating manual of the computer, it's impossible to make any sense out of the octal dump. Okay? So we know how to make sense of Panini by miracle, by the fact that there was uh, this parampara of teachers that kept teaching the language and the use of the grammar. Otherwise, it would be totally opaque. Puzzle. So, uh, here is the first uh, example of an abundance. These are the Shiva Shultras. So the grammar actually starts by giving another view of the Varna Mala. So, these are very weird Shultras. A, I, U, N. Rilik. E, O, N. So if you think this is uh, Sanskrit, you know, if you tell me uh, Panini's grammar is written in Sanskrit, <laughs> these are weird uh, Sanskrit statements, isn't it? Now you see the anu Anubandas here, there are these markers at the end of each sutra. Okay, and here you have the Vardamala, but in a really weird order. What is this? Shiva Sutras are used to define abbreviations for the families of phonemes sharing common treatment in the grammar. They are called Pratyaharas. So these Pratyaharas are condensed definitions. Each Pratyahara is of the form X, then phoneme A, Y. Where Y is an anubanda. And it denotes the set of phonemes between X and Y, markers exclude. For instance, nasals are denoted by nyam. So you remove the M and you have all the nasals. Okay? Uh, vowels are denoted by H and consonants are denoted by HAL. See? HAL. So then I look this until L and these are all the consonants. So this is a very compact representation of all subset of Varnas that are needed as characteristic properties for the machine operations. See? The nasals, they all share common properties, so you have operations that pertain uniformly to all nasals. So you use the Pratyahara as some kind of uh, uh, characteristic predicate. Uh, to have a very compact sutra that tells in parallel of all nasals. You do the same operation on each. Uh -huh. Now if you, if you look at it closely, you will notice that it's uh, not exactly the Varnamala. Every, everything is there, but ha uh, is twice in the list. So why is that? Uh, did, uh, did Panini make a mistake? 
no, no. <laughs> I mean, uh, when I first saw this table, I, I was very intrigued by this redundancy. You know, why is that? And the answer was given rather recently, a few years ago, uh, a German scholar, Wiebke Peterson. She did a complete mathematical analysis, you know, knowing all the subsets of Varna that you needed. You know, is there a way to uh, have this idea of Patiaharas, but without having this redundancy of her? And the answer is no. After, you know, pages and pages of mathematics, graph theory, and so on, she proved that it's optimal. So it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing that, you know, 25 centuries ago, we don't even know if there was writing uh, at the time. Uh, you know, how did Panini come up with that? Or who, who came up with it? It's the kind of appendix of the grammar. We don't know where it comes from. I have no explanation. This is very mysterious. This is optimal. And, and, she, uh, and she proved uh, several optimality results. Okay, we, we show that uh, Panini had some kind of prescience of information theory. How did he do that? Nobody knows. But, but wha what it shows is that uh, Panini and grammar theory is still a hot topic. There are many people working at, uh, at actually uh, understanding Panini's work to this day. Okay, now let's come to this worked out example. I was talking about Karaka, the semantic rules, but now let us see how to derive the same Karaka in the grammar. So Karaka is, uh, is this actor, semantic rule. So it's an agent of acting. So this same is a primary derivative, Kedanta, uh, obtained by the root Kur, to act, with morpheme aka, affixed to mo uh, with morpheme aka, affixed to the morpheme car, obtained by raising root cur to a second phonetic grade by the Vridi operation. So, I if you're not familiar with this uh, terminology, I don't have uh, much time to explain, but here is a simplified Paninian derivation. Okay. First, we retrieve the sign from root cur. Here we are right here on this uh, on this big keyboard for all roots, uh, the data pata cur, and then comes out of the database. Don't <laughs> uh, I put colors so that we understand what's going on. See the, this uh, do and the nya, they are uh, and windows. So they are markers. Kur is actually uh, Sanskrit. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, the stem of the root. Okay, so we have a little bit of Sanskrit here. Okay, and in green, Kurane, we have Sanskrit, but now it's a meta language. Sanskrit has meta language to explain the meaning of Sanskrit as object language. So it says Kur is used in the sense of acting. It is locative, means in the sense of. Okay, so, so you see from the Datupatai, you, you have the sign. So we first peel off the morphological parameters, the do and ye of the root. We record them carefully because they might be used by some uh, sutra later at some point. And we extract the sign components. This curl, which is the shabla component, and the arta meaning, which is a uh, transit in acting. See, I mean, this is semantic. See, you can use uh, English or any, any other language to, uh, to have the meaning. Okay? Uh, so, so, so the initial start is this sign, curl, acting. Shabda, arta. Next, we want to express the notion of agent. So it's an agent of root curve. 
So we go to the section of the grammar that concerns agent nouns, starting with Sutra 3.133, which is Dultritau. And again, this is word Sanskrit, yes? <laughs> so uh, so I again, I have put uh, Anubandas in red. And here, uh, Tur is the only Sanskrit in the sense of the object language that we are studying. And how is a Sanskrit suffix, vibective for uh, indicating dual. Okay, so what it means, so this is the, the commentators explain what is Nvil Trutchao by both Krit Pratyayas, Nvul and Trich are applicable to any root. It's very condensed. We are factoring uh, we are factoring information from uh, previous sutras and we are putting some kind of minimum information. And this house tells you there are two things and these two things you have to know that it's null and trich. Okay. So now we are uh, we select the first component, null, and now we are licensed to affix this pratyaya null to the current prakriti, which is kr. And this held the string kr null. Okay, now this red, see, it's, it's, it's acting. This is microcode of the machine. The machine goes crunching now. The first operation is the Anubada na, which is microcode for the Vridi operation, which rewrites car into car. See, you have three grades. You have car, car, car. So, so, so this N goes back, it looks at the first vowel, then raises it to the, se the second grade. Car. Next, the Anubanda string V. So it's some other mechanism. So somewhere we have another uh, keyboard uh, and we have V, which uh, encapsulates some uh, definition. V, V means Aka. So when you retrieve V, you substitute its value Aka, which you append to car, and now you have car Aka. Yeah. Completely mechanical. The last uh, Anubanda L, uh, it indicates that the accent precedes the suffix, yielding ac accent to Shabda, no, car Aka, yes. And in the Sutra is in the section of agent nouns. The new computer sign we get is Karaka, an agent of action, acting. See? So, and we keep going. Now, you have all kind of rules that tell you that this is a web pati padika, so you can, uh, you can use supratyaya, so you can get a, a pada, for instance, if you, if you use uh, uh, supratyaya and so. Su means uh, nominative singular, okay, and then by uh, further computing you will get karakara, okay, which you may now use as pada, typically as subject of a verb in the active voice, okay, and so on and so forth. But this, uh, this gives you one example of operation, you know, in all microscopic Ugly detail. Ugly or beautiful, depends your taste. And now if you think that this trivial example is very complex, please consider that it has been considerably simplified. Since a lot of bookkeeping administration has been omitted, um, omitted, such as checking that the invocation of the sutra is not barred by possible application of rules having higher priority. Okay? So, so this is not the end of the story. In fact, it, it's not really, it's not that it's complex. It is just very low level programming of the machine at its microcode level. This is similar to programming in machine language in the early days of computer science. So this reminds me of my youth 
when I was uh, writing, uh, you know, machine code <laughs> before having uh, high-level languages. <sighs> so, uh, of course, in contrast, the conflict resolution rules that manage the relative priority and mutual blocking feeding of the rules, the so-called annuity, they are rather hairy, to say the least. So we shall not discuss these rules, nor the meta rules that direct the general control flow of the machine. We just restrict our attention to the actual data processing prescriptive rules, uh, so-called VD sutras. So let us call script the sequence of VD rules necessary to derive a Sanskrit sign. And then we'll say the script is Paninian if it is correct with respect to the conflict resolution rules. The analogy with computer programming is that the scripts are the programs of the machine. And checking that they are Paninian is analogous to compile time type checking and other sanity checks of the compiler. See? The compiler is uh, uh, protecting the machine from erroneous operation. And, and this is true to this day. Yes, a modern computer uh, has sequences of instructions that are illegal. Illegal to the point that they can completely block the machine. Okay, so we never program in machine language anymore. We always use a high level compiler. Whose duty it is never to generate these illegal combinations of rules. Ah. Ah, this is kind of uh, dreaming in search of a Paninian programming language. So our scripts are actually pretty close to the Prakriya explanations of the pandits, of the grammatical tradition. You know, condensed invocations of the sutras. Such as, do krin vulsu. For a, a pandit, this is clear what this means, yes? Min karaka. <laughs> Organizing them systematically in hierarchical manner would lead to some kind of abstract syntax of a somewhat esoteric programming language. And uh, I think it would be an interesting research program to exactly define this formal language and use it as a conceptual basis for a software implementation of Panini's machine with some kind of... So here I'm, I'm sketching. Uh, I mean, this is kind of looking in the future. I'm like... Uh, uh, like the manager of a company who wants to build a panini machine, yes, I'm explaining the, uh, my business plan. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so first we have to design this core microcode interpreter, paninium. Yes, then we have to design a formal Prakriya machine language. Then we have to write some compiler of Prakriya scripts into paninium. So that they are executable. Then we have to write the decision decision procedure for recognizing a script as Paninian. So here you will go through the script and say, you know, are you allowed to use this sutra at this point and so on. This is the uh, in charge of the compiler. The machine is not concerned with that. The machine is a lower level. Then we can uh, could design some uh, high level programming language, Vivac for expressing clear statements of the locutor communication intention. Yes? And then we would uh, write some comp compiler for v uh, Vivac Shah that would generate Prakriya scripts that are Paninian by construction. Uh, uh, I mean, this is not very detailed. We have to look in detail at the feasibility of this, but the uh, important point is that it's modular. It's modular, so uh, it means you can share the work between teams in doing this part or that part. Okay, you don't have to uh, to, uh, to tell uh, one PhD student, now you have three years and you have to complete Panini machine and yes, and then you'll get your diploma. Because this is just too complex. It doesn't work. Uh, this uh, sketch of the complete set of production from Vivaxial statement to executable Paninian Prakriya scripts. 
and there are many uh, variations, so I'm, I'm going to go very uh, uh, rapidly through this. Uh, because at the sentence level realization, this could be realized in more of a constraint programming methodology. And, uh, and you, uh, we don't need to have all this uh, kind of bottom-up view of generating everything from roots. Uh, so, so we could look at, uh, at it from the other uh, view, viewpoint of, uh, uh, of uh, percolating the user intention into what is possible using the machine. Uh, so there are some uh, uh, analogous treatments in, in logic. If you look at, uh, uh, at mathematical logic, you have uh, two views of expressing proofs. One is natural deduction also called as lambda calculus, and this is a sort of, kind of a generating view. Uh, but if you want to construct proofs, because you're, uh, you're, you're doing mathematics, so you're, so you're, so you're doing some kind of backward reasoning from the theorem you, you want to prove into uh, axioms at the bottom. So this kind of uh, uh, backward uh, reasoning uh, could be uh, analogous to logic programming uh, at the prologue, rather than functional programming at building everything. Okay, and uh, so other variation to design could be modularized by using dictionaries. Yeah, dictionary would store the stems, padipadika, with a complete prakriya to produce them. So we don't have to reproduce. This operation all the time, they are there stored in the dictionary. Uh, now we turn at uh, previous attempts at making Panini machines, starting with hardware. Are there any uh, Panini machines on the market today? Uh, yeah, so you, you go on, on Google, you ask uh, Panini machine, <laughs> give, <laughs> give me a price for a Panini machine. So uh, here is a Panini machine. <laughs> it's a wrong Panini machine. <laughs> Does not obey the specs. Here is another Panini machine. Oh, look. This is hardware Panini machine. Uh, eh? Here you have a stem. And uh, you recognize various allusions to uh, uh, to Panini terminology on this piece of hardware. This is this is very intriguing. Where is this Panini machine? Archer is Panini machine was demonstrated at the International Sanskrit Computational Sim Linguistics Symposium in Mumbai in 2000. Hmm? Hyderabad. I did happen in what year? 2009. Oh, sorry. Here in Hyderabad. <laughs> Actually, the machine is in Hyderabad. Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and here, uh, Pandit is explaining the machine. Yeah, Sanskrit grammar machine. <laughs> So here I'm co quoting from uh, Languages and Literary Cultures in Hyderabad, uh, a recent book. Uh, so Rao Harkari was an eminent scholar, multilinguist, eminent critic, and a multifaceted genius. He was fluent in Persian, Arabic, Telugu, Marathi, English. He acted as translator in the Special Criminal Court of Hyderabad and toured extensively in the dominion of the Nizam. Then got associated with the High Court of Justice uh, and became district judge, deputy collector and session judge at Gedwal. But his interest was Sanskrit. Yeah, so he learned Sanskrit uh, and he obtained all kinds of prestigious titles like Vachaspati, Vidya Bhushan, uh, Vidya Bhaskara, Pandit, he even got a certificate of honor by Rashtrapati government. And in his later life, he worked on a teaching aid called Sanskrit Grammar Made Easy in a te technological form and composed a guide how to handle the machine. Unfortunately, he did not get the fund to uh, completely complete the machine, so we have only a partial prototype. 
uh, but I think that's very interesting and that we should uh, investigate more and uh, perhaps l try to find his notes to uh, uh, exactly assess what was his contribution. But see, he had this idea of building a Paninian machine and, uh, and his idea was to use it to teach the student to make the, the, the work easier uh, of using the grammar by uh, using the operations of the machine. So, so this is uh, right in the topic of the talk, actually. Uh, now, now uh, software attempts at uh, implementing your study. Uh, yeah, there are many, many attempts. So I'm not going to list uh, all that in detail. Uh, this uh, paper is uh, interesting. Saru Jabate and Subhash Kak uh, wrote uh, an interesting paper called Panini Grammar and Computer Science in 1993. So it's uh, somewhat one of the earliest attempts at, uh, at comparing uh, Paninian methods with computer science. Okay? And uh, the second one I list is uh, Shiva Murti Swamiji. Uh, he's the, the pontiff of the Lingayat community. He's uh, Matt, he's in Sirigere, near Bangalore. And uh, I visited him 12 years ago and he was working at an uh, implementation of Panini called Ganita Shadiai, which he did himself alone on his PC and, uh, and, uh, and he had uh, vi very good notions on how to go about uh, storing the rules, recognizing them and uh, so that's, that's uh, interesting, uh, interesting work. Uh, then uh, we have uh, many uh, teams that work on, uh, on the problem for foreign and Peter Scharf, who is in the room here, uh, work with his colleague uh, Malcolm Hyman at various aspects of uh, mechanizing Panini. Uh, out of this work, the, the <laughs> they did this lies, which is a, a kind of, uh, of uh, book that uh, said the precise uh, low-level requirements for a phonetic representation uh, in terms of uh, modern standards. So that's very useful. Uh, then Pawan Goyal Lakshmi Darbera uh, at Kampur IIT and Ambal Kulkarni. Uh, worked on uh, computer simulation of HDIE, so that's 2008. Then uh, uh, many more, uh, about the same time, Anand Mishra did his PhD thesis uh, on uh, trying to implement uh, Paninis as a computational uh, machine. Wipke Peterson and Oliver Helwig in Germany uh, also uh, reported partial results. Uh, then some more uh, uh, recent work by uh, Sridhar Subana, Srinivas Varkedi on the conflict resolution techniques. And Bakulkarni worked with Pawan Kumar and Ramakrishna Machrayulu. Uh, this is reported in World Sanskrit Conference uh, 2015. Uh, the same year I, uh, I evoked the first ideas about this Sanskrit signs and Paninian scripts. This was the initial ideas on that. Uh, Daval Patel and uh, Shiva Kumari Katuri uh, uh, write uh, Subanta Generator. And I remember 12 years ago, uh, uh, Shiva Murti Swamiji, he, he told me, you know, uh, if, you, if you're not careful with Panini rules, uh, the machine may loop. Yes, yeah. Like, uh, like in the tripody, uh, there uh, you, you can uh, you can make some germination of consonants in certain circumstances. Yes, and if you iterate, then uh, then you'll get chatra uh, chatra chatra. Okay, so you have to uh, have a, a, a metalinguistic rule saying you 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 apply it only once. So it's only by doing a full implementation that we shall. Uh, have a complete view of all the Paribhasha Sutras, all, all the meta-rules that are necessary 
uh, in order to have a, a, a complete terminating machine. So, so, th so they run into these kind of problems here in the uh, implementation of the Subanta generator. Sarada Susarla, Rao and uh, Sai Susarla uh, uh, propose uh, an implementation PIAS uh, last year. And at the same uh, World Sanskrit Conference, uh, Samir Sohani, who is a student of Malar Kulkarni, uh, uh, explained the computation of the study. He has some view of uh, representing each Panini Sutra as a ha Haskell program and how to link all these uh, Haskell pieces of code. So, so none of this uh, implementation is complete, but here we have uh, ideas on how to uh, uh, implement partially uh, operations of the Panini machine. So, so the, this contributes that they explain various problems in software representation of Panini concepts, uh, such as conflict resolution techniques, which is hard. Some have succeeded in emulating VD portions of the grammar, but a complete solution still some seem far away. Actually, some scholars have expressed doubts about the whole endeavor. Peter Scharf explained diffi difficult points in conflict resolution, which will need specific additional research. Uh, and uh, Anand Mishra recently published uh, the result of uh, I don't know, 10 years of work, modeling the Panin system of Sanskrit grammar. And uh, he expresses doubts at direct simulation of HTDIE devices. Okay, so we should uh, uh, not uh, perhaps try to follow to the letter and, uh, and get some, uh, uh, some kind of more general device that will be easier to control. So there's a full emulator of Panini's machine is still an open problem, but we see no theoretical impossibility at implementing a software implementation reasonably consistent with HTDIE. So this I will conclude my talk with uh, listing some uh, uh, actual fundamental contributions of Panini to informatics. So no matter how long it will take to write a software simulation of HDI, it remains that Panini made important <coughs> contributions to informatics and information theory 25 centuries before the first investigations of recursive function theory in mathematical logic and the advent of electronic computers. Thus, it is not an overstatement that Panini should be considered as an informatics pioneer. So I'm listing a few uh, features. Uh, this metalinguistic marker, see, it's a really a general innovation. Then, uh, when you look at the uh, rules for defining Sandy, you know, these rules have four components, and they, and they are uh, isomorphic to the description of the rules that that use the scientists, for instance, that you are so anyway, the, 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 the formulation for this uh, transducer theory, you, you, you need four, you need records and four One is the context, uh, the, the, the rule. Uh, one is the left part, uh, the left word that, uh, that you're blowing with the beginning of the right word, and then the replacement. So you need to express these four components. And, and you can recognize in Panini Sutras, some kind of record notation where the in, in, where you know the record fields by, by using the cases of the grammar. Okay, so that, that's, that's funny. Then uh, he, he was working really in formal secondary writing. <coughs> 25 centuries before uh, Emil Post uh, did uh, mathematics in around 1940, which gave uh, rise to to all the uh, you know, formal language theory. Uh, a hierarchical scope and, uh, uh, and selection by pattern matching. You know, all these uh, priority rules you can uh, recognize something analogous to, to pattern matching in uh, functional programming languages where you, uh, you start with. Uh, 
You start with special cases, and at the end you put the general case. And if any need the reverse, you first give the general rules, and then you give exceptions. Then you separate special cases from the exceptions. Basically, the same. Then he had this uh, notion of conflict resolution for no determinism. Uh, the Tadit uh, section for describing the, the secondary suffixes uh, is organized in some kind of object oriented description according to the meaning of the suffixes. And everywhere you have some keen information theory awareness. Oh, I like, uh, like this Matiaras. Or uh, compaction by sharing, so, so you have uh, you have sutras uh, that are uh, shared by grammar operations at various levels of the grammar. They only say to compact because you had to compact to force out the sutras so that the, the kid that school could memorize all of it. Okay, so it was essential. So. Uh, I don't think Panin needed to be recognized as a Ragi Ganaka. Or a primal computer scientist. Thank you, Dara. On behalf of the uh, University of Hyderabad, as a token of gratitude, please accept a moment of that. Now I request the Professor Kane Murthy to propose what of thanks. Hello, am I audible? So I have the pleasure and privilege of, you know, extending Krithagnyata and Dhanyavada on behalf of University of Hyderabad. Some of you may be wondering why KNM suddenly from nowhere he suddenly popped up for this, you know, uh, uh, task of, uh, you know, expressing the gratitude. Uh, I know Professor Yuet from long time. It was, I think, 2002 or something. I had to visit uh, Paris on a UNESCO uh, conference, and I also visited his lab. And we went, uh, traveled together to Nazi. We had some lectures there and so on. And then we had initiated a Indo-French research network in computational linguistics. He was the French coordinator, and I was the Indian coordinator. Not too many things happened, but we initiated some of those processes there. So from that time onwards, I've been keeping, you know, a watch on the developments in all these areas. I know only so much of Sanskrit, and I have only so much of interest in Sanskrit computational linguistics. But it's very interesting because the way this uh, linguistic things that we are doing in the in the context of Sanskrit is directly related to the principles and theories of computer science. So that's what makes thing very interesting for us and I've been following. Anyway, uh, it's a great honor for me to extend a, you know, uh, our sense of gratitude for Professor Hewitt for having come all the way and given this most wonderful lecture. I hope all of you, all of us enjoy. I, I take this opportunity to thank our PVC2, Professor Raj Shekhar, and uh, the entire university administration, uh, whoever is involved in making this uh, an event a grand success. And most importantly, all of you for having come here and and, 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 and showed interest in keen, uh, keen interest in this uh, wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. Sir.